Well, you guys, uh, you know it's an appropriate week to talk about uh, bringing up kids here with Eli's sons. <laughs> you know, this, this study, does it, yeah, no kidding. Uh, and and that, that is a, a call to us to look out. There are kids that could really uh, use this just like we use it. God works on us just, and God can work on kids. So I uh, encourage you there. And, and uh, getting in this week, isn't it something, this, this study this year, you know, we, at the beginning of the year we said it's going to be an adventure. And it seems like every single week, I mean, it's like your favorite TV show. You're just, I, I, you know, I I'm, I'm can't wait to get home now and read the next lesson. Uh, and the same thing this week, you know, you, you get so much that happens and so much you see God working and the way he works. And then you see all these lessons that we get to soak in. And well, so we're in a transition here. We talked some a little bit last week about the time of the judges. And we're moving to the time of the kings. And we do that through first and second Samuel. Uh, and you get to read in the notes, it's got a good summary that this used to be one long book and, and generally they think it's just too long for one scroll, so they divided it up. Uh, so you got First and Second Samuel and you keep in mind that this was, what we're reading about happened a, around 1100 BC. So it's like 3,000 years ago and yet God could preserve this word in this detail for us to study and that's a testament in itself. So we look this week, you can see there's uh, the three divisions. The first one is uh, dealing with the birth of Samuel. And of course, the second one we mentioned, you know, Eli's sorry sons. Uh, and then the third chapter is this actually this call to Samuel. And what, what I'm going to do, if you guys don't mind, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to the second division first. Because I, I think it helps to address uh, what Hannah, what the kind of environment she was in when we talk about what was going on here in the church. You know, uh, we talked about this, this time period of the judges, a time of disobedience with God's people with Israel. And anytime there's disobedience, there's problems. And so we can look at the, the condition now. Last week we talked a little bit about the condition of the people. Well, you know it's going to filter down if it's talking about disobedience of the people to the church. And we can see the condition of the church here. You know, as, as Moses and Joshua had both predicted, you know, God had commanded to, to get rid of all the Canaanites, don't go and hang out and marry with the Moabites, and God's people didn't obey, and it leads to problems in both the people and the church. So we start off here in this section, verse 12, it says, Eli's sons were scoundrels. In some versions, they were wicked. They had no regard for the Lord, and of course, we see they're, they're skimming from the church coffers. And they're, they're taking what is supposed to be a first fruits offering a gift from God's people to God and from that they're supposed to get a gift and that you know it says they're supposed to stick their fork in the in the pot of boiling meat and whatever comes out that's what they're supposed to get well it, you can see Eli's sons are turning this on its head you know they're now they're demanding you know they want the well marbled ribeye and they said they want the fat and so they're actually they're stealing they're demanding the first fruits of the first fruits you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough situation. They're stealing from the Lord, and, and the Israelite people know it too. You know, we read in there that when they would, might question Eli's sons, oh, wait a minute, we're supposed to burn the fat off. And Eli's sons say, hey, you don't give it to me, I'll take it from you. And you think about it, this is God's house. This is a church. And back then, this was the church. And then where else are they going to go? We have lots of choices and lots of churches these days, but, but not for God's people. And if they wanted to be obedient to God, this is where they came and this is what they faced when they came. And we think about, you know, we always read this. We try to, to think, oh, how does this apply to us? You know, one way to think about it, and, I, and one way I thought about it, is the first fruit giving to the Lord. You know, of course, first fruits, we think about tithing to the church. We think about our money and our things. But in particular, and I, and I thought it and I heard I sat in a couple classes and I heard it again and again, and that is our time. You know, how often do we, you know, we kind of, we think maybe we're giving God first fruits, but they're really seconds. You know, how often do we give of our, our energy and our thoughts? You know, when we wake up in the morning and we start worrying, if that's the first thing we do, well, how have we given God our first fruits of the day? You know, turn to Him in prayer, seeking His peace. You know, instead of, I'm going to worry first and I'll think about God later. I promise I'll do it, God. First fruits, you know, that's just, it's convicting to me. Uh, but we get back here now into 
uh, verse 22, we, we talked a little bit about Eli's sons, and it says, Eli himself heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel. You know, and how they slept with the women at the tent of meeting. And if he's hearing about all they're doing, it, everybody knows about it, and you know what's going on, you know it's prevalent. And you just you think about these guys that are there at the tent of meeting, you know, and what a sorry state Israel was in if that's that, the house of God. Uh, and then, of course, we know, we, and we've talked a lot about the big thing in the lesson here is that Eli, he talked to them, but he never removed them from that point of service in the house of the Lord. And we can think about, how, you know, how does that apply? There's obviously there are parenting lessons here. And if any of you out there is a parent, you know, good parenting is hard work. It's not easy, right? And so God's calling us, hey, it's hard work and we need to step up to it. Um, you know, why did, why did Eli not take them out of service? Was he, would he think, would it embarrass him to do it? Was he just, was he getting old or did he like getting the good stakes? Whatever it was, uh, it's telling to us uh, on what, what, what our call is in our own parenting, in our own lives, and how we're supposed to respect uh, the church itself. But moving on there, you contrast what's going on with Eli and his sons. And now, granted, I've jumped ahead. We're going to come back to the first division. But it says, in contrast, meanwhile, Samuel continued to grow in stature and favor with the Lord. You know, thankfully, and, and of course, he's tutoring with Eli. And Eli is apparently a lot better, like me, at do as I say and don't do as I do. And so he's getting the best of what Eli is saying anyway. And he's growing with the Lord. Uh, but then you have this prophecy that comes in against Eli and his family. It says, a man of God came to Eli and explained this prophecy about Eli and his family line. And they're going to die and they're going to be disgraced. And whenever God gives prophecy, we know because it's in the Bible it's going to come true. And we don't have to wait very long. We're going to see it this coming week in chapter 4, what happens to this fulfilled prophecy to Eli's sons. And, of course, what we learn when God fulfills prophecy is that, it, number one, it proves God is God. He's the only one who can speak to the future and then make the future happen to what he says is going to happen. And because he has fulfilled so many prophecies in his word as we keep learning week after week, you know, we can learn, we can trust him. He will fulfill what his prophecy is, even those, of course, that have yet to pass. And the biggest, of course, is the return of Jesus Christ. He's going to judge all sin. He's going to reclaim his world. And from all of us believers, thank God, he's gonna, he's, we're going to have eternal fellowship with him. And that, as Christians, of course, is our bedrock belief. And so when we get to see all these prophecies fulfilled, you know, hundreds of years after hundreds of years, we get to stand on God's word more firmly uh, in our faith. Now, by contrast, if we don't believe God's prophecies will be fulfilled, well, then it's... Then it gets easier to say, well, maybe I can ignore this or ignore that in a word. It's a slippery soap, and pretty, pretty soon you're at Eli's son, standing at the tent of meeting. You know, but, but why is it that God, why does God bother to teach us these warnings? I mean, he's already given us the rules to live by. You know, why does, why does he care so much that we know this, that, we, that he preserves for 3,000 years these stories? Well, of course... Thankfully, it's because our Heavenly Father loves us that much. He wants what's best for us. He wants us to live with Him in eternity. He wants us to accept salvation in His Son, Jesus Christ, so we can do that. And so what does this reveal about God and His warnings in His Scripture? Well, it, that is our principle. That God warns of sin's results because of His protective love for us. You know, a, the, a simple example, parent says, hey, don't put your hand up here on the stove. Well, you know, us kids, well, we say, well, if they said don't, I think I want to do it. But we're t it's for a reason. It's for love. And speaking of it, you know, it makes a lot of us, especially with uh, adult kids, you know, we, that we should never, never give up on kids. I've heard it said that love knows no lost cause. Love knows no lost cause. And that's when we have hope. Uh, in our Lord, that we can always go to Him in prayer. And how can we reach the next generation, by the way, with the Word? Well, what a handy night for Ken Erdl to come here and say we have a great opportunity upstairs every week. Uh, but speaking of going to the Lord, that takes us now. Let's go back to the first division here with Hannah. 
Um, all right, we start the story off. Everybody did first day in the lesson. Elkanah, he's got two wives. And you know, uh-oh, there's going to be problems. This is polygamy. And the Bible clearly calls us to monogamous relationships. And it says that El Elkanah is a descendant of Aaron, the priestly line, so he knows the rules. So why does he have two wives? Well, first, we know, like a lot of sin, it creeps in in the culture. And if we're hanging out with the Moabites back then and we're starting to disregard God, well, the slint sin is slipping in. And, of course, if you have two wives, well, now you've got divided loyalties. You know, you divided up your love, you divided your loyalties, and then, and then we, and I always, I always try to say, all right, Kelly, it's 2018, I'm here in Texas, I don't see many people with two wives, so what is, what is this teaching us? There's a reason that we're, we're reading it. Well, one thing, and I, I read this this week, is spiritual polygamy. Spiritual polygamy, and it's divided loyalty. Who is your master? Who are you reporting to, the world or to the Lord? You know, when Jesus came, he's asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? And everyone remembers that. Jesus said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind. So there's no rivalry. He's number one. Um, so anyway, here's Hannah. And she's stuck. She's got another wife in the house. And, and back then, of course, of course, birthing boys was important. They were a valuable commodity to you in the family. Women who gave birth to a lot of boys, they were thought highly of. Women who could not give birth, they're thought lowly of, even maybe thought of cursed. And of course, you know, we know in today in this modern day of medicine, well, that's, that's not at all, that doesn't make any sense. But as we also know, public opinion and common sense don't always have a lot to do with each other. Uh, so here's, here's Hannah's environment. And, and, of course, which, which woman do you think Alkana married first? You know, it says, the text says, and it doesn't say who he married first, but it does say that he loved Hannah. But, of course, if Hannah is not able to provide children, then, you know, a, a, a pretty good guess is that that's why he married Penana Pen, Pen, and brought her into the house in order to have children. Now, thankfully, though, Elkanah, he did consistently love and he did consistently honor the Lord. You know, we see they're going three times a year regularly to Shiloh to worship. Uh, and it says here, and this is really important, it says the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. Now, why would he do that? Again, we have to remember the times. God needed a new leader. He needed a leader that was dedicated to the Lord. And not somebody that maybe like me that did, took, it took a long time before I started really realizing what God's teaching me, right? He, he needs somebody that's committed from birth. Uh, now, Hannah, she obviously loves God, but you think, it was she really ready to give up what, what many parents is the ultimate sacrifice, their firstborn child? Which, by the way, is what God gave up for us, Right? You know, God is obviously preparing Hannah for this. And we talked a little bit about in James 1, about rejoicing in our, in our trials. And ultimately, that is uh, letting steadfastness have its full effect. So by the time Hannah is, has reached this point that we read about, she's ready to make this sacrifice, ready to have this child she raises up for one purpose, to serve God and to see what God would do that. And of course, we read year after year, the poor lady, they're going up, and this Penina, she's just mercilessly provoking her to the point that she wept and would not eat. Uh, and, then, and, then, and then, you know, poor Hannah, she's probably she's feeling like she's lacking meaning. She's feeling isolated. And a person who feels that way, they're lonely, sad, disregarded, while it looks like the rest of the world, you know, has uh, what they want. You know, where do they turn in that situation? Do they turn to people? Do they turn to their spouse? And this is kind of funny. You, you hear Elkanah is reading, Hey, Hannah, why are you weeping? Don't I mean as much to you as ten sons? And then you see the silence. There's no answer. <laughs> Hannah's a woman of grace, but if she had the mouth of her rival, she'd probably turn the question around and say, Well, if, if I don't mean more than ten sons to you, why did you bring this other woman in the house? Right? <laughs> you know, and the point is here that what Hannah teaches us is that we can always go to God. You know, people, God's the ultimate fulfiller. No matter how much people love us, our spouse, no matter how good they may be, they're never going to have the power, 
the ability and the love that God does to fulfill what we need. You know, He can heal our hearts. He can fill our need. He can give us joy in all circumstances. Um, and, and so we see there in verse 10, Hannah is turning to, to God in heartbreak. It says, in, in her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord and weeping bitterly. And then she made this vow, of course. She said, God, if you give me a son, I will dedicate him to you. Now, is she bargaining with God? You know, no, I don't think that's the lesson at all. That's, we, don't, we don't get to bargain with God. But what she was doing, she's crying out to God in love, and she's making a commitment of love. God, I, I, if you will please do this for me, God, I will give you the greatest gift I can think of, my firstborn son. And that's exactly what she gave up. She's cried out, and then God, of course, he acts. Um, she's, she's, and I would say she's not bargaining, she's begging to God. But she's begging also in God's will, for God's glorification, to give this to God. Uh, and of course, again, Israel needs a new leader. And God needed a mother who's going to birth this leader. You know, 2 Chronicles 16 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. God's always looking for whoever's seeking him to have a relationship and to build them up. All right, now we're back to, back to Hannah in the culture here. And she's, of course, she goes in the, the tabernacle and we know Eli and he's, of course, maybe he's ready to minister to people. But the first thing he does, he sees Hannah praying and accuses her of being drunk, which is probably, incidentally, another statement on the condition of the people. You know, why in the world would the, would the priest, be, you know, this maybe it happens all the time. That's just, that's the time. And, you know, of course, Hannah humbly but boldly corrects Eli and says, I'm not drinking. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. And thankfully, Eli, maybe he's a little embarrassed, says, you know, may God grant your prayer, which, of course, God did. And then here's Hannah so humbly saying, uh, may, may your servant find favor in your eyes. Which, of course, that happened too when she came back and she brought this firstborn son to him. Uh, and then this really, really cool in verse 18 when it says, Then, you know, she ate something and her face was no longer downcast. And isn't that the power of God to be able to go to him that he can bring comfort? It's not like complaining or crying to a person who can't do anything about it, right? This is going to God and how he gives us that comfort. Prayer refreshes our soul. Uh, and then we know, of course, that God says the Lord remembered her. And she conceived, she gave birth and, uh, and named him Samuel. And so God acted. And you know, God doesn't, of course, always answer our prayers the way we want it and the time we want it. But we also have to remember, whenever we go to God, we're asking for a gift. And a gift is a gift. God gives great gifts, better than we can ask for, but it is a gift. Uh, and we think about this sacrifice that Hannah made in giving up her young son. Uh, and, and you're reminded, by the way, of the kind of people that she saw when she came to this tabernacle. She's going to give up her son to God, and these are the kind of people seeing Eli's sons. But nonetheless, that's her faith. She says, I don't care if it's, if, you know, there, there may be dangers involved, and it speaks to us. My, my dedication is to God. Uh, and then we get in at, at the beginning of chapter 2, you have this beautiful prayer of praise and prophecy from Hannah when she says there's no one holy like the Lord. Uh, and, she, and, the, and, you could, and I wish I had time just to read through this prayer again. The foundations of the earth are the Lord's. And we remember this is years after she's ma made this prayer originally to God. You know, and that, isn't that had so common in the stories that we read? We, we read it you know, in, in a few minutes. We cover the story in a week. But this is people praying for years and God works um, and then you have this prophecy in verse 10 he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed well, we know this same was being raised up uh, is going to be the one to choose King David who's anointed and then after that of course it refers to Jesus who is the ultimate king who's anointed and the principle here, and I've got it up here, and it's a long one, but uh, when we pray in accordance with God's will, we can trust that He answers bigger and better than we could ever ask on our own. You know, God knows how to comfort our hearts. What is the cry of our heart today? Why am I not seeking Him in my struggles? How often do I try to take it in my own hands and worry it out of existence? I had a good friend that once said, if you're in the World Series, it's a long time ago, he said, if you're in the World Series, 
time of the World Series. Bottom of the ninth, two outs, you're up at bat. Who else are you going to ask to help you? Now, God's not in, in the business of helping us win World Series, but he is in the business of helping us win at life. And he is the one we can turn to. All right, now we turn to the third division, the third chapter, and it's, it's a short one, but a couple of really cool things here. We know that God's calling Eli, and he's, and he's repeatedly calling. Of course, Eli's going over, I mean, God's calling Samuel, excuse me. Uh, and Samuel is, is saying hello, and, he, and, and Eli said, hey, that's not me. You need to go back to sleep and finally recognize it's God. And it shows us how God pursues relationship with us. He'll keep calling. When he wants to call, he'll keep calling. And it's a hint to us to listen for God. You know, just finally, like Eli recognized and told Samuel, listen for God. And then sure enough, when that fourth time, Samuel said that I am listening, God. Speak to me. And what a message that is to us, right? And it said Samuel did not yet know the Lord. And of course, that message is that knowing about God is not the same thing as knowing God. And out in the world today, if there was one thing that you'd just love to be able to tell people that don't know God yet, don't know God yet, religion is a completely different thing from a relationship with Jesus Christ. Um, and we know the next morning that uh, well, the next day Samuel ends up he ends up getting this prophecy about Eli and Eli's family. He's got to tell Eli the hard truth. It's yet another prophecy that comes true. And we see as we go on that, that Samuel is increasingly attuned, his ears, his mind, his heart, to God's work. Because he knows God's calling him. And then we say we apply that to us today. Well, we know God, and we know God calls us. So what do we need to do? We need to do what Samuel did and listen. How well are we listening for his calls, and how well are we answering his calls? And the principle on this third chapter is if we listen with an open heart, God will call us into his service and plans. And you guys know that to be true. If we open his word and we pay attention to what he's saying and we lean in and listen to his voice, we will hear him. He will call us into his, into his will and his service. And I finished with this. And I heard it said uh, from the pastor of this church. And incidentally, if you go to church here, Please we express thanks to you and people in your church for continuing week after week to open up to let us come in here. Uh, but the pastor here said, you know, study the Bible for a long time. And it's not those issues and those things that I don't understand in the Bible that keep me awake at night. It's the simple, straightforward call and command of God. That's what gets my attention. And that, man, is what, uh, what we can bank on. God's always given us a message, Lord. Uh, we appreciate it, Lord. And let's, 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 let's all of us open our ears to Him this week. Open our eyes and our minds. See what He says to us. And then let's see if we can take that step forward in faith and answer Him. All right, Jim, well, thank you. Let me uh, thank you in advance for, before I pray, for stacking up the chairs as always. I appreciate that. Let's pray. Dear God, this moment we stop to praise you. We praise you for the God who tells us what's going to happen in your word thousands of years ago, makes it happen, Lord. And as we rely on from last week, from Romans 8, 28, that those you have called, those who love you, Lord, that in all circumstances you are working it for our good. Please let us open our minds, our hearts to your call, Lord, to do the good that you've created us to do, Lord. We love you so much. We thank you for your grace afresh every day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a great week.